Hi, I'm Steve Cooper, Rank Success, and welcome to another episode of my Police Promotion and Leadership Podcast, giving you CPD on the go wherever you may be listening. This episode is one where I was recently invited uh, by the Police Federation of Sussex Police uh, to attend their engagement event. Uh, And this is a a week-long event where the Federation uh, lead the event uh, across Sussex. So that's across uh, Worthing, Crawley, Brighton, Eastbourne and Hastings stations uh, through the engagement event. And the Federation lay on uh, lots of help and support and advice and guidance and assistance for uh, officers uh, around their daily duties. So if they can visit, and what I saw was lots and lots of people uh, making use of that, uh, particularly around financial advice, mortgages and other support that the Federation brought together across those stations during this week of engagement support. Uh, Whilst I was there, I also interviewed Chris Thompson and Chris is the uh, Federation uh, Treasurer and Deputy Secretary for Sussex Police Federation. He was very kind enough to uh, to have an interview and that's what this podcast is essentially about. And I asked Chris some questions, including what are the main differences between the work that the local and the National Fed uh, Federation do uh, to support paying officers, um, what are the biggest issues that they took from the Police Federation of England and Wales Pay and Morale Survey. And I ask, does this tally with the main issues that officers seek Federation support for in Sussex? I also ask him if leaders in forces could fix just one thing now to improve the well-being of officers and had all the resources to throw at it, what would it be? And lots of other questions. And I'm very grateful to Chris for taking that time out to do that. I hope you enjoy this episode. Um... And it's relevant to your police leadership and promotion ambitions because if you are uh, a sergeant, inspector, chief inspector, in charge of teams, in charge of people, they're going to need to know what advice and support and guidance assistance is available to them. And clearly the Federation in Sussex are really going out on a limb to support officers through events like this. I believe there are other events planned and I know they also support officers at attestation events. Uh, it with similar support right from when they join the service. They're doing what they can to ensure that the experience of officers when they join policing is as good as it can be, despite all the challenges that they will no doubt face. Um, If you've got something interesting to say on policing and promotion and or leadership, uh, get in touch with me uh, to arrange an interview. I'm even happy to share my platform if you've got a story to tell, uh, either by writing a guest blog post, which can be anonymous if you wish, and or recording a verbal message to feature as a guest podcast. I'm always happy to share my platform to promote a diverse range of perspectives in policing whilst creating informative content for you. So I hope you enjoy this podcast and this interview uh, with Chris Thompson of Sussex Police Federation. And for info in a moment, I'll be giving you a quick overview of the support that Rank Success offers aspiring cops and the benefits of becoming a podcast subscriber. Then we'll get straight into the episode. And of course, as always, you can let me know your views in the Q&A on the podcast notes. At Rank Success, I'm committed to giving you the best police leadership development, levelling the playing field of promotion, whatever your budget and wherever you are. I invite you to explore my free blogs at policepromotion.blog and videos on my YouTube channel. There's topical police news, salary information, deep dives into diversity, CVF explainers, explanations of promotion assessments and various aspects covering your police leadership and ongoing CPD. All this content will firstly help you become a better police leader and then secondly succeed in your promotion process. To go further you might consider becoming a subscriber of my podcast not only will you be supporting the free content I create for others, but for just four ninety nine a month, you'll also get extra subscriber-only episodes. You'll be the first to access all new episodes and have access to the best of my back catalogue, whilst also getting an exclusive 25% discount on my market-leading promotion materials. There's no commitment and you can cancel any time. Want to smash your promotion with tried and tested prep? If you've got an upcoming board or you just want to get ahead of the competition now, consider my structured, succinct and rank specific toolkits. These help focus your effort on the right things, including examples of what good evidence looks like, explainers of the CVF, plus a myriad of other essential content to help you achieve your aspiration. Others have described these materials as a godsend, like gold dust, 
helping to tame the monsters in your mind and have even stated there's nothing else like it. See countless more testimonials on my website from successful cops who took action and got in touch. There's e-guides, my professional recorded masterclass video, plus my in-depth CVF explainer video, or indeed special bundle offers on everything. Or come join me for an all-inclusive day on my next in-person promotion masterclass. All this and more is available from my main website at ranksuccess.co.uk and the return on investment will come in your first month's salary increase alone. So that's an overview of what I can do for you and without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Hi, Steve Cooper, Rank Success, and welcome to another Rank Success podcast. And my guest today is Chris Thompson, who is the Treasurer and Deputy Secretary of Sussex Police Federation. Uh, Welcome to the Rank Success podcast, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Could you explain for listeners a little bit about your role uh, currently and what it involves in supporting officers here in Sussex? Yeah, of course. So I've been the Treasurer for about a year at the Federation it's so my first sort of full-time federation role, um, and as well as being treasurer, I'm a trustee of the group insurance scheme. I manage our holiday lodge, and um, there's a lot of other things that we do. But the core role as treasurer is to look after not just the finances of the branch um, and assist federation nationally to do that, but um, just as importantly to look after the governance and just to make sure that everything is in tip-top order and that everyone knows that it's in tip-top order. So I'm working on a piece at the moment about transparency and the appearances of transparency with my um, trustees who hold me to account as well as the board. Okay, thanks very much for that, Chris. And we're here together for Sussex Police Federation's Engagement Week, Police Federation Engagement Week. Could you summarise for listeners what the Engagement Week is all about, the different venues and who's involved in it? Yeah, of course I can. Um, so the engagement week is a, a new process that we're running um, this year and we're hoping to do two of them and we're at the end of the first one. And what I do as treasurer is I also manage our business relations and historically we've worked with a number of businesses uh, at a nil cost to our members and in fact recently we've um, started charging a small administration fee to work. And what we do is we give reliable and honest companies um, access to our offices to offer them some really good products and services. So things like Rank Success, which is fantastic, and we we get it into the officer's psyche. The Engagement Week is about, um, if you ask some people, it's about free stuff for cops, but more importantly, it's about getting cops to understand what's out there. Because I think anyone who's been in the policing sector will know that cops are often very time poor. You know, you work shifts, and we hear it all the time about things like mortgages or insurance policies. They're not looking at it weeks in advance. It's like, crikey, it's due tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And what I can do and what our partners can do is help them manage their day-to-day life, support them through promotion, help their financial well-being, and even their physical and mental health. So we've expanded our portfolio to include some therapeutic services as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's gone down a real treat. Brilliant. Okay. I don't know what that noise is that's just piped up. Sounds like a garbage truck or rubbish truck just coming out the back. Okay. Um, So, um, I mean, I've I've enjoyed this week. Um, uh, It's the first time I've been in this side of the country, so I've been to Brighton and Hove, and yesterday to Eastbourne, and today here we are at Hastings. Uh, For me, there's a lot of officers, there's a lot of noise going on nationally around uh, policing, but what I see is many of them very young cops Mm. which reflects the the national uplift i expect and the experience walking out the door of policing i see many cops coming in uh, and going out to calls to the public there's no difference really in terms of uh, the generations that i've seen from when i was in um you appear to be doing quite a lot to support them have you had any feedback in relation to that yeah i mean so the federation now locally is a different beast to it was 10 years ago Mm. 10 years ago you had to go and knock on their door Mm. and ask for help Mm. you had to go and find out what they could do for you Mm. whereas now we absolutely want officers to fully understand everything that we do and everything that we can offer Mm. because what we don't want is an officer who could have got our help and support not to to understand 
and go through things on their own and actually our group insurance policy or even the federation themselves can support them. Okay, thanks very much. And what would you say the main difference is between the work that you're doing locally in the federation and the national federation levels do uh, to support paying uh, officer members? So I wouldn't say there's much of a difference. So locally, we do lots of things to support officers uh, and give them sort of tangible benefits there and then. We also do lobby, lobby government by conversing with our local MPs and our chair is really good at actually getting meetings with regular meetings with the MPs to discuss the important points that our cops want the government to understand. It's about pay, it's about morale, it's about pensions, it's about working conditions. And all that the Federation nationally do is very similar, but they might do it to the front bench, whereas we do it to MPs. Um, often we find that our paths are aligned, mm -hmm. uh, but there are some local issues that we focus on that national wouldn't, because it's not an issue nationally. Mm -hmm. So very very similar, but at just different scales. Okay. And, and what do the Federation do to support its members who want to progress their professional um, police careers and are there any plans to do more? So um, you're one of the examples Steve and, and I must thank you for all you do. Again you know and I've, I'm sure you've heard this week that we need to get that message out more. Sometimes it's really hard for officers to understand the role of the Federation mm. and what we can't do is pay for things that the force should be doing. Mm. So we, we can't go out and commission services to assist people with their promotion. But what we can do, and what we have done recently, is set up some peer support groups, uh, and that started at new chief inspectors who were promoted. Mm -hmm. And there was really two or three focuses as to why we did that. Firstly, the training uh, in Sussex, at least, for when you're promoted is often, there's some stripes, there's some pips, there's another pip, mm -hmm. crack on. Mm -hmm. And that's not right, and the force should be giving them proper training. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is get a pool of recently promoted chief inspectors and get them to have peer support so if you've got a chief inspector who used to be uniform and goes into a detective role there'll be a detective chief inspector in there same with a sergeant if you're a detective sergeant and you get promoted back to response and you've not worked in uniform for 10 years well actually you've got a colleague who's been a pc on response acted on response we can pair them up but conversely, it also assists us in supporting our members because these are the leaders that implement the rules and procedures and look at the fairness of situations. So if we can get into those ranks and say, look, this is what regulations say about how you can treat your officers. Mm -hmm. This is what you must do. These are the kind of things that we come across. And um, we use our equality lead, Andy, quite a lot in those meetings mm -hmm. because there's a as a rule of thumb, what we want, one of our purposes is to make sure everyone achieves the professional standards that are set out. What people think that means is helping people when they've either pressed the stupid button or something's gone wrong with conduct. But it's also about making sure that everyone, regardless of their situation, has the same ability to achieve success. Mm -hmm. So Andy, as our equality lead, is a real useful tool. So when we talk about officers who may not be performing to their best, rather than waiting for the force to try and muddle through a support plan and, and then go through stage, like the informal stage and then stage one, we get involved and we come in and say, well, there's no support in that plan. Mm. What we ask is, look, supervisors, come and have a chat with Andy, see what the kind of things he can offer. Mm. He's got contacts nationally, which are fantastic, mm. that if he's got a situation, because there are a wide range of issues that people have. If he doesn't know about it, he's got contacts that will. And we can help the force to help officers reach that professional standard mm -hmm. and indeed exceed it in many cases. And we've had instances where officers are, when you talk to the supervisors, it may look like they're trying to get rid of them, which isn't the purpose of that, that policy. And actually by Andy working with them, they end up with a really effective officer at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Don't get me wrong, there's times when we don't end up with an effective officer. And we have to have a conversation or the force has to have a conversation about is this the right career for you but everyone should have that opportunity to succeed yeah and then and coming back to some of the things you said there about the training when you get promoted to whatever rank to sergeant inspector chief inspector it seems inherent that 
I've, I've written blogs around the postcode lottery of police promotion, mm. and that means around the, the, the way that promotion looks different in different forces at different times or different ranks. But there seems to be a common, consistent theme that when you get promoted and you work really hard, you know, getting qualified to pass the exam, and then you go through whatever selection process you go through in whichever force you get to, and then you get very little. It's almost like a lottery about whether you get any meaningful training which clearly links to standards and behaviour yeah. of supervisors. And some forces will promote people. And I appreciate it's difficult. It's not always a simple issue, but they'll promote people. And then they'll, as you say, there's your pips, there's your stripes, there's your extra pip, off you go. Certainly for sergeants, which is, mm. I think, almost a, a marker of the, the culture of an organisation, is the standard of its first-line supervision. It's absolutely critical that sergeants should get some form of training. And I think some of the material I supply to people, um, just for articles to read, uh, some of it's like 25 years old saying the same things mm. and from other countries saying newly promoted sergeants need about 80 hours of basic management training if they haven't had it in order to be effective at their job. Mm. It just isn't happening. Um, do you think that will ever happen? Do you think that officers will get any meaningful training at the point that they need it in order to come back to your point around matching the standards and expectations required of them. So I think that's a really interesting point. Now there is a course for new sergeants, new inspectors. In Sussex. In Sussex. Yeah. Whether you get it before you've been in the job at that rank for several years, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a real simple solution. You get your pips, you get your stripes, you get the next rank, and then the first tour of action you have is a training course. Mm. And it should be a meaningful training course. You know, you'll always get cops that are like, well, you're teaching me what I already know. Brilliant. This training course may not be for you. Mm. But it's for the ones that haven't had that exposure. And you've got to bear in mind, you get cops that have acted in that rank for five years mm. and then get promoted. And you've got cops that have never acted that get promoted. Mm. You've got to have a mechanism to level it up. Mm. And this is what we say, because it's not just about the rank. It can be the role as well. Mm -hmm. And the higher you go up the ranks the less training and the less support there is potentially for that role. It's mm. just an expectation. You're a chief inspector, now you're a detective chief inspector. Or you're a uniformed chief inspector looking after response in Hastings, now you're an ops chief inspector looking after firearms. Mm. Well, they're, they're both groups of cops and managing people should be the same. Mm. But obviously there's a lot of complexities in there at both ends mm. that we don't necessarily have training on. You know, I think, I, I would never say that there's ever enough training, so I'm a little bit of a, <laughs> you know, I, I think the more you invest in people, the more you'll get out. It's like a bank account. The more you put in, the more there's And, there. and I think for me, that's where this engagement week really clicks because, you know, people... Uh, want to develop their own careers. The College of Policing's Leadership Review uh, number one recommendation was that all uh, aspiring leaders, existing leaders, take responsibility for, responsibility for driving their own uh, personal and professional development. And and, and I come across officers who, who simply don't know where to go to do that. Mm -hmm. And the College of Policing offer lots of online things and modules and so it doesn't always attract the best feedback mm -hmm. in terms of what's available to them. But um, for, for me, I, I see at this engagement event, people walking past and having a Scooby-Doo moment going, huh? You know, I never knew that that kind of thing yeah. was available. So this engagement week, I think, is, is touching on opening up for people lots of the benefits that are available to them, not just for CPD, i.e. Uh, with me, but also some of the benefits that the Federation mm. are putting in front of their noses that they also don't know about financial support, mortgage support, travel support, that kind of thing as well. And it's gone down really well, and you throw some cakes in as well, mm -hmm. don't you? And Everyone loves free cakes. Cakes and chocolate and biscuits, mm. so that helps as well. But I think that, so I'm going to jump in there. Please I think, do. I think Please that do. goes back to the whole... You know, the reason why we get partners in to, to give officers this support is because they're time poor. Mm. You know, you spend hours on working shifts, you've got to see your family, you've got to be a good parent. Having the opportunity to then think, oh, I might go on the MPCC's website. Mm. Well, when are they going to do that? Mm. And actually, training doesn't necessarily have to be provided. It can just be time. Mm -hmm. You know, right, every month you get one day to do something that's going to better yourself. And it doesn't need to best sell yourself as a leader. Even if you did something, a bit of charity work, mm -hmm. went for a run, mm -hmm. did something to make you a better person, mm -hmm. you'll ultimately be a better leader. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we've got that regimen in 
from Sussex Police, and it, mm. that would be a really good change. Yeah. And I think the, the 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 reward versus the the cost would be fantastic. Mm. Okay, thanks so much. And just moving on to the Police Federation of England Wales Pay and Morale Survey that they did a while back. What 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 were the biggest issues that you took, and that you know the Federation here took from that survey? And does this tally well against the main issues that officers seek Federation support for in the Sussex? It's one of those things. I've ne- I've been in the job twenty two years. I've never been in a position where cops thought they were fairly paid. Um. But with the changes from government, with regards to pensions, the lack of address in working conditions, in terms of the regulations are often decades old, it seems like we're often forgotten about, and that's clear in the pay and morale survey. We're seeing more people leave, or it has had the appearance of people leaving. The attrition rate of new recruits has increased. And part of me thinks the government changed pensions to save money. But they also said that they wanted people to dip in and out of policing. They wanted it not necessarily to be a job for life now. And that's what we've got. And the problem with that is to be a decent cop, to become ready for that next stage, generally you're you're looking at five years. Mm. But those those same issues, regardless as to whether you look nationally or locally, you know, poor staffing, poor wages, poor conditions of working poor pension, well, and actually I'm going to rephrase that, a pension that's been reduced, because it's not a poor pension, the new pension is fantastic. Mm. But what you've got to look at is if you remove some part of your pension, you've got to look at the overall remuneration. Because a lot of people do join with the view of it's a bloody hard job. Mm. You know, we've just had some, um, uh, we just had an officer re- retire, having spent 30 years on response. Mm. You know, 30 years of working nights, they've earned their retirement. Whereas now, <laughs> you know, they'd be almost two thirds of the way through their career. They'd have another 15 years to do. Mm. And I don't think that's fit or healthy. I think the government have got to listen. I think the local federation are doing some really work, good work with the MPs making them understand that point. Mm. Because the, the media will be, well, police pensions are still fantastic. Yeah, they, they are really good, don't get me wrong. But you've got to look at that overall package. And particularly now, staffing in Sussex, um, I don't know what's happened, but, and again, when we talk about cops, I've never been in the job and someone's like, oh, we've got too many officers, mm-hmm. you know, all the numbers right, but I've never known it to be at, at this levels so bad throughout multiple departments. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, if leaders in forces could fix just one thing right now to improve the well-being of officers and i don't know whether it is about one thing but um what 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 would it be and um, what would you want fixed first magic wand situation or yeah. what, what we've got the, well a bit of both let's have both magic wand situation and um, well actually I'll, I'll start first i still think policing is the best job in the world there's a lot of cops that i hear oh i wouldn't join again and I think that's just a moment in time. Mm. You know, when you spend a lot of time working in any job, you're going to have periods where you're like, oh, crikey, come on. God, you know, I'm not sure this is a job for me. The next year, you'll be like, best job in the world. Mm. I personally still think it's the best job in the world. If my kids said I want to be a cop, mm. I would be absolutely, you know, happy for them to go in. Mm. Uh, but the biggest change that we can make, Magic Wand style, is giving the cops the opportunity to be cops and having the capacity to do a good job. Mm. I see a lot of cops break, not because of the volume of work. Cops make things work, cops get things done. We could have a response section where the minimum is 12, four cops could turn up and the city would be as safe as they can be. You know, other people would just walk out and just be like, no, we're closing the factory. Mm. Cops get stuff done. But what they do feel really passionate about is providing a service. And when the force and government don't give them the numbers, and the tools to do that service, that's when it really hits cops hard. Mm. And that's when you see mental health issues. Don't get me wrong, there's, it can be not just the volume of work, it can be the type of work, but predominantly cops want to help and we should be enabling them to. And I don't think as a government or as a, as a police force we do that. More cops will, will make a healthier workplace, bring back a lot of the positives of policing, and I think that would make a massive difference. 
Okay. And clearly, obviously, cakes help, biscuits help, um, mm-hmm. federation support and making uh, the benefits available to cops, uh, raising their knowledge and awareness and also helps as well. Um, so with the ever intensifying pressure and scrutiny of officers being evident in well-being surveys and, and general dialogue between officers, including on social media, how concerned are you about the nine o'clock and round the clock and chock a block jury in 2024 on policing? Now, this is a really tricky one because historically we've had chief officers saying if you make a, a brave decision with the right ethos, so you're doing something for the benefit of society or a victim or to the safety of the public, even if it turns out to be the wrong answer or the wrong decision sometime later, you'll have that support. Mm. Now, that is the key ethos of every p- policing decision. Mm. You know, I don't think there's... I'd like to think that there's not very many malicious cops that make decisions for the wrong reasons. Mm. Cops get it wrong. I think we should have a lot more of a learning environment. At the moment, there is a nine o'clock jury. At the moment, the the, the regulations say that misconduct should be about learning first. Mm -hmm. Unless it's egregious, it's not a conduct issue. Mm. If someone makes a mistake, they've made a mistake. That's no problems at all, mm. and we accept that. Don't get me, get me wrong. There are people that need to exit the organisation because they aren't the kind of people that you'd want to serve next to. Mm. But ultimately, most of the time, I think PSD get it right. Mm. You know, and I'm not saying that they get it right in terms of what they should do. But if there's some potential, there's misconduct, they should look at it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I don't think anyone would say, although it's not nice being investigated, that they should turn a blind eye or like, oh, that's not an issue. <clears throat> I don't think they get it right all the time. I think the more things that the Federation do at all ranks, like the sergeant rank, the inspector rank, the chief inspector rank, the more influence we can have. Mm-hmm. And, and that learning culture has got to be key. We don't get it right all the time. But if we're trying to get it right and it doesn't work, then that is that is an absolute learning thing. And I think, as I say, the more input that the Federation can have at those sorts of ranks, the bigger change we'll have. I've seen it work really well. I've seen things go wrong for the right reasons or mm. for what the officers were trying to achieve, and people have accepted that. Mm. I've seen things go wrong just because things go wrong, mm. and it's gone the other way, and people were referring things to PSD, and, mm. and you're like, this officer's out at three in the morning, it's raining. They're the only person there. They might even not be a supervisor. Could just be a PC trying their hardest. And I think as long as you bear that in mind, I think you can't go wrong. From a personal point of view, we get it right sometimes on the force. Sometimes they don't. When they don't, that's when the Federation really challenge. Yeah, and, uh, and there's a lot, and we could talk about that for, for, for a long period of time, but for me also, it comes back to part of the ingredients of that is around it, you know, when people put themselves forward, they've got skin in the game to get promoted, mm. and they, they want to progress their career, whether that's through the ranks or just for the, for the first rank, it brings us back to that standard of first line supervision, and everything else should, in an ideal world with a magic wand, mm. fall into place above that, so the courage of sergeants, the ability, the skills, the knowledge, the training, enthusiasm, determination, all that kind of thing links in as well because if you can fix those standards at that level or have the behaviors right at that level um hopefully it will mitigate some of the risks around the mistakes being made so coming back to the pay and morale survey it highlighted that many officers in policing still think that promotion is unfair and whether that involves pdrs application forms interviews or something else what would you or the Federation ideally want as the fairest process to promote the best candidates into limited positions? So strange enough, I was listening to your podcast today <coughs> and you okay. said something which I absolutely agree with, that no matter what the process, it'll either be a, have the it'll either be fair for some, fair for more, but there will always be people who think it's unfair. Mm. You know, whether you have a promotion process which is boards and application forms and, you know, quizzes and or you have a promotion process where you promote people who are successful on the job at acting, it will always be seen as disadvantaged by some groups. I think the key isn't what the process is. I think it's the openness, it's the transparency and it's the feedback which we often forget. 
that makes a real difference. We have, uh, so I can talk about personal experience if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've um, just before I came into the Federation, I had what's called a future focus meeting. Mm-hmm. And that's where you speak with your first line of supervisor about where are you on a scale of needs improvement, suitable to current role, future potential for promotion, next one year or two, or or indeed, you know, ready now for promotion. And that's the, the pathway that Sussex uses. Mm-hmm. Now, I was put at a level. Uh, that was the last I heard. It goes off to moderation. And then a couple of months ago, so nine months after that decision, mm-hmm. I asked, oh, can I just confirm, did I stay at that level? And I'd been actually moved. I'd been moved down a couple. And I was like, oh, well, that's disappointing. And it's not disappointing that I was moved down. If I need to improve, perfect. You know, that gives me a challenge. I'll go and do something. Um, but it was disappointing I wasn't told. Hmm. And then when I asked about why was I moved down, well, there were no notes. No one could tell me why. Hmm. You know, and that is unfair. Mm-hmm. It may have been a fair decision to move me down, but without feedback, without notes, without transparency, how is that fair? Hmm. That's not uncommon. I've had officers that we've supported who are waiting for the letter through the door to say, your board is coming up, here's the day, because they were ready now. Mm. And when they call up, oh, my letter's not come. Have you said it's the right address? Mm. Oh, you're not, you're not ready now. You're suitable for current role. Mm. That officer's leaving. Mm. Yeah. And it is, it is, the promotion process is one that I, it's, it's, it's challenging. It's, it's mentally challenging. It's, uh, it's emotional whether you, get uh, whether you're successful or not there's emotion involved in it uh, people react differently to being told they're unsuccessful on different mm. occasions and I think you hit the nail on the head there that feedback is really important because it's you know feedback or feed forward however you want to mm. think about it it's giving someone an inkling into what they could do better and I see this not just as Sussex I, I speak to candidates who are both successful and unsuccessful, often by a very small amount. And the the feedback across all forces ranges from nothing Mm. and being upfront, transparent, being told you'll get none when we've not built that in, to really meaningful Mm. follow-up appointments with the panel, with each candidate, being provided with a written summary of what they did well, what they what their clear areas for improvement were, and also in the in the best forces, a development plan. We've got keen, motivated, enthusiastic, mm. determined, imperfect officers here striving with skin in the game to get promoted yeah. and progress their careers, and they need some help at that particular point. So they get put on a development plan, yeah. and that involves shadowing. It involves uh, uh, directed or, or supported learning. It sometimes involves funding. For people, that, so that that's a massive the, parameter, the aren't they? That would be the dream. Yeah. Oh. But why do you think some forces can do that and some forces can't? Now, I think we've got a process where it should happen, and and there's some complexities in the moderation. You know, they're not minuted. Mm. My view is, and and, I, and I've heard stories where officers have been uh, had their grading changed because of what happened or may have happened mm. a year or two previously where a supervisor's observed them doing something they didn't agree with. Mm. And and why are you not challenging it there and then? I, th- I think the Sussex have got a good start of a 10. Mm. I think um, they could do a lot better. We talk a good game when it comes to development. Like, oh, yeah, you know, you get promoted, you'll get a course. You'll get a detective sergeant's course. It'll be brilliant. Right. But when you are, when will that course be? Mm. Oh, we only run two a year. And they're full for the next six years. Brilliant. I'll be an inspector by the time I get that course. Mm. When we talk about promotion, they talk a good game. You know, absolutely want the brightest and best. Absolutely want you to achieve. Absolutely want to remove barriers. But then when it comes to the crux of it, I just don't think they've got the mechanisms in place. Mm. And I don't think it's not hard. Mm. So the colleague, um, you know, I've got a colleague who's going to the Met and they um, showed me their feedback. They were successful. Mm. But they, they literally were, and I, I don't like saying good things about the Met. I think there's always that county versus <laughs> the Met adversarial nature, mm. jokingly. But they showed me the feedback. You're talking pages. Mm. And they were like, if I hadn't got through, I couldn't have really argued it. Mm. But I'd bloody know why. And I'd get through the next time. Yeah. 
it's not hard. It gives you a benchmark. When yeah. you put yourself forward to it, there's a lot of uncertainty. And, and I think a lot of what I do, if people feedback to me, is I demystify the process and mm. remove the uncertainty around it. But feedback does that as well because it allows you to have a benchmark and go, okay, I've threw myself into it. I've got tunnel vision now. I can't remember what happened mm. in the board or what my blind spots were. Um, but this feedback actually tells me I appeared, you know, I, I, I didn't appear confident. I was knowledgeable. Yeah. I got all the right stuff across, but I didn't feel appear yeah. very confident in some of the answers. And therefore, they took it as un, being unsure. Brilliant. I can work on my confidence yeah. going forward now. And other people go, it's a really low score. I've got a lot more work to do. I better go back yeah. and get some meaningful evidence together in order to be able to and don't, get, don't get me wrong. We do have feedback mechanism for the board. Um, I don't think it's as robust as it should be mm. because I do some board things. I take meticulous notes because if I don't, you interview four or five persons a day mm. and you're like, were you the bloke? Were you the bloke? Oh God, which one were you? And it's, it is hard work, mm. but you almost need a minute taker in those meetings because if you, you're either listening or you're writing yeah. really well or you're doing both a little bit, not quite as well. Yeah. But this also comes back down to that training issue. Because if you've got qualified people who have been trained effectively, that feedback should be from the start. You should have sergeants who are confident to say, actually, that's not the way we do things. This is how we do it. We have, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying sergeants don't, but that's the culture we should start at the very outset. Mm. Mm. But sometimes without the training, it's really hard. You know, how do you, there's obviously the, uh, and I'm sure it's national, the cake fine. You know, you forget your keys, you crash a car, or you do something silly, you, you lose your head, cake fine, that's fine. That, we joke about it, it's a really good feedback mechanism. But what do you do for the more serious things? How do you give sergeants, supervisors the confidence to tackle those situations and provide that feedback? And you do that by giving them good training. Mm. We've got a really simple policy, but again, cops are time poor. You know, can I spend an hour reading policy so I thoroughly understand it? Mm. But also then, can I have an hour when I need to use it again in six months' time so I can thoroughly understand it? Or do I just try and muddle through? Mm. If you have that training, and that training is not just about learning on that day, it's about sitting in a room with 10 other cops who had just been promoted. Mm. And like, oh God, I think Dave said he did that, or Laura said she did this, or I'll give them a call. Mm. And that's why you know the peer support groups, I think, hopefully will make a really good difference on that side. Because mm. everyone's got like a... God, you won't believe what happened this month. And the people listen, they'll learn from that. Or even if they don't learn from it, they'll be like, I know who I'm going to call if that happens to me. Exactly. Yeah. So, a supportive network. And yeah. it sounds like that's a really promising um, initiative. So um, it wouldn't be right for me to be speaking to a Federation member and not ask you this one. There's been some controversy with the Federation nationally amongst its members since the pensions decision. Uh, most recently, uh, reflected with a vote of no confidence in, I think it was North Wales Fed. Uh, how is the relationship between national and, and, and local federation? How so would you describe So our local federation actually really good. Uh, we get a lot from the local federation, uh, sorry, from the national federation. Mm. I work with the finance team quite significantly. Um, and obviously our books are their books. Uh, so that works really well. Um, I, there are, or I've got to be careful for my own personal concerns yeah. rather than that as my role of a um, treasurer in the local branch. Uh, my thing is transparency. Mm-hmm. And I think that's key. And I'm not entirely sure they're there yet. And I think if they were, uh, and I'm working on that locally, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I think we could be more transparent locally and I'm doing all I can to improve that. But I think transparency is the key mm-hmm. and the, and the appearance of fairness. Because even if it's fair and it doesn't appear fair, well, it's not fair. Yeah. And I know that sounds, I'm sure that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, yeah. but you can do all the work in the world. But if you don't show what you've done, yeah. and you don't show the reasons and rationale and the decision making, then people can't have an informed decision. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with the Fed locally and nationally, which is why, you know, these engagement events are brilliant. We've got 40 odd workplace reps who do some fantastic work. You've got the five officers in the main office, fantastic work. You've got our civilian staff, fantastic work. Getting out and telling people everything we do is the key. Mm. And it's the same with national. They do loads of stuff. They don't tell anyone they do stuff. They do, but people don't read it because they're time poor. You know, if I've got an hour spare, I'm going to spend it with my family. 
not researching the Federation's website to see what they're doing lately. So that's why getting out, doing things, forcing it down people's throats is so important. Yeah. Okay. And and you've also uh, just launched a new a new magazine as part of your communication strategy as part of doing what you just said. Um, it's called 1020. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm going to hark back to the days when I joined. We had Patrol, a newspaper that came out every month. Everyone was like, oh, you know, moaned about it because cops started moaning, but everyone read it. That got removed to save finances and then left a real hole. Um, and what we understand is that cops are time poor. So if you've got a magazine in the canteen and they're eating their lunch, they might look at it. If they're on a scene guard and they're going up to the hospital to look after someone, well, actually, I might take that magazine and have a read with us. Mm-hmm. And it's really important that we don't just focus on getting officers to engage with us in one way. Mm-hmm. And the magazine is a fantastic example. You know, the first issue, our bravery nominee of this year, absolutely spot on. And what's really key is we've done that all without using any of our members' money. Mm-hmm. We've got advertising in there from people, um, our other partners, and, and they've come in, they see the value of it, and they've basically paid for that magazine. So mm-hmm. there's an adage, you don't get anything for free. Mm-hmm. Well, we at the Federation do all we can to get that. Mm-hmm. And that magazine's an exact, exact example. And it, we're always worried when you do something new because cops moan that nothing happens and then when you do something they moan that you've done it and it costs money yeah. I've only heard positive things about that magazine which is really good yeah well I mean I picked it up yesterday and uh, one of the officers uh, is you've interviewed in there scrutiny must be fair is the article um, Carrie 23 years on response Carrie Ann O'Connor so that's uh, you know that is um, you know 23 years on response mm. It's, it's amazing. And the other one you talked about, 30 years yeah. on response. So there are cops out there spending that long on, yeah. on response. And uh, like you say, I think that magazine is, is pretty uh, is pretty impactive, really, um, as a first issue. So yeah. I wish you all the very best with it as it as it rolls out. We, we've set the bar high for the second one, is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you had any initial feedback on it? As I say, wholly positive. How can you not like seeing about our brave officers? Yeah. You know, and all those sorts of things that we're doing... We have, um, we're looking at award ceremonies that we can put on. Our ethos is it's got to be for the members. Mm-hmm. Anything that we do, what's the benefit of the members? And the magazine is clear. The benefit is they get to have something to read, learn a little bit about stuff, have some information about the Federation, whet their appetite. They might think, actually, that's the something I want to get involved in. You know, we're always after workplace reps. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a win-win for us, and it's all at nil cost. How can you complain about that? Yeah, and it does seem that, you know, from a federation perspective and how it's landing with the officers, that there's a lot of positivity going on in a challenging time and resources and all the other issues that are complex in policing. So thanks very much for taking the time uh, to speak today and to answer a few questions for listeners. I really appreciate it, Chris. And uh, if you're listening, I will be back with another podcast in due course. And then until then, uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you. If you made it this far, thanks for listening and I hope you found that helpful. Let me know your views in the podcast details and Q&A section or by tweeting me or xing me as it is at rank underscore success. Uh, If you or a colleague have something interesting to contribute on policing, promotion and or leadership, by all means, please get in touch. I'm always happy to share my platform to promote a diverse range of perspectives in policing whilst creating informative content for you. If you like this podcast, please consider becoming a subscriber. Not only will you be helping to ensure I can continue creating free content for everyone, but for just $4.99 a month, you'll also get a load of great stuff on top. This no-hassle, cancel-anytime offer provides extra subscriber-only episodes, priority access to all new episodes, and access to the best of my back catalogue. Should you want to go further and hit the ground running, you'll also receive an exclusive 25% discount on my market-leading structured promotion materials to help focus your effort. If you want in-person support, check out my website for upcoming masterclass dates. I only do a few a year, but they're action-packed with targeted support. You'll leave with great clarity on your force promotion process and with all the tools you need for success. Attendees most often describe the day as inspiring, informative and motivating.
Others have said it cuts through the fear of fog, confusion and nerves, and one went so far as to say it's the best money I ever spent on my own promotion development. Gave me the right frame of mind and motivation to succeed second to none. So all the best in your career aspirations. You can see a suite of support on my website at ranksuccess.co.uk plus my popular free blogs at policepromotion.blog. Until next time, take care and stay safe.